Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. Our presentation today is entitled, Facilitating Drug Discovery with HDX Mass Spectrometry. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. in our presentation. While the chemistry behind hydrogen deuterium exchange, or HDX, has been known for quite some time, coupling the systems to sensitive mass spectrometry detectors has led to the commercial development and use of HDX mass spec for aiding the biopharmaceutical industry with drug discovery. As biotherapeutic molecules become increasingly more complex, companies have become more reliant on sensitive methods to facilitate their molecular characterizations of their compounds at speeds that allow them to stay relevant in this ultra-competitive drug development market. Let's meet our panelists who will discuss their experiences using HDX mass spec for simplifying the process of selecting promising new biopharmaceutical entities for therapeutic intervention and for understanding the interactions between a therapeutic and its biological target. Our first speaker today is Ganesh Anand, Associate Professor at the National University of Singapore. Dr. Anand will provide insight into his recent work using HDX mass spec to identify lead fragment compounds through high protein ligand binding studies, as well as some new research to uncover novel sites within macromolecule assemblies. The second presentation will be given by Kai Zhang, a consultant biologist at the Lilly Biotechnical Biotechnology Center located in San Diego. Ms. Zhang will describe some of her recent work on epitope and paratope mapping studies of monoclonal antibodies using HDX mass spec and the benefits toward the drug discovery process. So before our speakers get started, I want to encourage the audience to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll try and answer as many questions as we can, so simply type your question in the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit submit. So, let's begin our webinar and open up the floor to our sp first speaker, Ganesh. Thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. My name is Ganesh, and I'm from the National University of Singapore, and I'm going to be describing some of my group's research on applying amide hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry to monitor the dynamics of protein ligand interactions and what the implications are for drug design. It's well appreciated that an understanding of dynamics is critical for correlating structures of biological macromolecules with their function. So in this slide, I've listed some of the most commonly used methods for structure determination. These include X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, small angle X-ray scattering, and NMR. NMR has been traditionally used for uh, probing dynamics of uh, macromolecules together with fluorescence and EPR. And function can be studied by enzymatic assays, cellular assays, and molecular interactions can be studied by surface plasmon resonance and isothermal calorimetry, just to name a few of the methods. Recent, a recent entrant to uh, studying the dynamics of uh, proteins in solution is mass spectrometry. And structural mass spectrometry has numerous methods that are being increasingly used to uh, probe uh, dynamics in solution. And shown here is where it is positioned in the biophysical sciences at the intersection of computational biology, structural uh, methods like X-ray, NMR, and cryo-EM, medicinal chemistry, and, and, and at the interface of downstream biochemical and cell-based assays. This increasing application of mass spectrometry for probing protein dynamics was captured in a CNE News edition from April 2012, where they described mass spectrometry as structural biology team's rookie. One of the methods within structural mass spectrometry that has gained the most prominence in recent years is amide hydrogen deuterium exchange by mass spectrometry. Uh, 
So HTX theory was well established by NMR several decades ago, and this has now been applied to monitoring amide hydrogen deuterium exchange biomass spectrometry. So a quick overview of HTX theory. So if you have a representative polypeptide backbone, as is shown, the exchange that's been monitored is at the backbone amide hydrogen position. So these are shown in red. So these hydrogens are can be abstracted by hydroxyl ions from solution and replaced by protons from solution. But this rate of exchange is non-uniform and is strongly dependent on the local environment. And so if you want to learn about the relative deuterium exchange of different across different regions of a protein, you can measure that by replacing the aqueous solution with buffers reconstituted in deuterium oxide. So use the same equivalent buffer reconstituted in deuterium oxide. Deuterium is the heavier isotope of hydrogen. And since it's, it, it's, it's, it's approximately one atomic mass unit heavier, mass spectrometry can be used to monitor the increase in mass as a function of incubation time in deuterated buffers. Backbone amide hydrogens thus serve as powerful conformational probes. So shown on the left panel is a cartoon of a protein that just shows the backbone amide nitrogens as purple spheres and the hydrogens as white spheres. So if you replace the aqueous buffer with the one constituted in deuterium oxide, the deuteriums are shown in green, those regions that are less ordered as well as are more solvent accessible would be expected to undergo a faster rate of exchange with deuterium from solution. And so this allows HTX to be a powerful method for probing protein dynamics. The advantages are that proteins do not require any modification. They can be analyzed at more dilute concentrations, and there's no obvious protein size limits. Uh, want to, how do you capture the deuterium exchange uh, itself? So if we take a representative uh, uh, peptide bond in the undeuterated state, and if you, if you consider a particular peptide, it would have a specific characteristic isotopic envelope that uh, reflects the natural uh, abundance of largely C13 and to a smaller extent N15 in nature. So you have this characteristic isotopic envelope in the, in the undeuterated uh, state. Since there is exchange going on, but since protonation is not increasing the mass uh, by through this exchange process, you're not going to see any uh, specific pattern of the uh, deuterium ex of the proton uh, itself because it's not contributing to um, and uh, increase in mass. But if you replace the uh, aqueous solution with deuterium oxide, then in addition to the distribution of C13 in nature, you will see a characteristic envelope that also reflects uh, exchange with deuterium. And shown here in green is uh, the exchange uh, uh, of, of a protein uh, of, a, of a particular peptide from a protein in one condition uh, and uh, how that differs from that at another condition for uh, exchange that has occurred for the same, uh, that has been allowed for the same time with deuterium oxide uh, in, in bulk solution. So the dashed lines represent the centroid, which is the uh, uh, the, the central mass, uh, and uh, if you subtract out the uh, mass of the undeuterated uh, peptide, this allows for uh, uh, capturing the average number of deutrons that have been exchanged into the peptide for that particular point. So this allows you to capture both the kinetics, that is, increase uh, in exchange over time, as well as allows for uh, a comparative tool for looking at the effects of perturbations on uh, proteins. 
So what this allows is of a heat map. So if you have a crystal structure or an NMR structure or a homology model, the relative exchange that occurs in each part of the protein can be mapped onto uh, the structure. And those regions that exchange more readily uh, are shown here in red uh, compared to those regions that exchange much slowly and represent the more folded cores of proteins allows you to get a visual um, overview of which parts of the protein exchange less or more uh, at a given state of the protein. So it gives you a, a visual heat map of the protein. So HDXMS offers a readout of both solvent accessibility as well as hydrogen bond strengths and propensities. So uh, together, it, it gives you an overview of protein dynamics. And so that makes it a powerful uh, method. So um, the work for HDXMS uh, experiments is uh, shown here in this slide. Um, so it, you start off by incubating the protein or protein complex in, 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 in a buffer that's reconstituted in deuterium oxide or heavy water. And the time course that can be monitored is milliseconds and longer time points. And so since it's uh, closely dependent on pH, pH 2.5 represents the pH at which the magnitude of exchange slows down several fold. And so this represents the quench condition. Since it's uh, the quench condition is uh, acidic, in order to localize where the deuterium exchange has taken place on the protein, this is coupled with a proteolytic uh, cleavage step. And the protease that's most commonly used is the acid-stable protease uh, pepsin. And so this is used to completely digest the protein, the deuterated protein, at that particular given point. And uh, we use electrospray mass spectrometry to um, measure the extent of deuterium exchange in each of the pepsin fragment peptides uh, in, in the target protein. So I want to point out that prior to the deuterium exchange experiment, the undeuterated protein must first be digested with pepsin under the same conditions used for the deuterium exchange uh, experiment. And then what we first do is sequence all of the pepsin digest fragments using uh, Protein Links Global Server 2.4 PLGS. And the sequencing by MS to the E is first carried out so that we have a directory of all of the pepsin fragment uh, peptides of our given uh, target protein before we begin the tutorium exchange experiment. And these peptides would represent uh, the conformational probes for our particular experiment. So the hydrogen exchange mass spec and structural mass spectrometry setup we have here at the National University of Singapore consists of two uh, Synapt uh, high definition mass spectrometry systems, um, a, a generation one and a G2SI, ESI quadrupole TOFs from uh, waters. And uh, shown on the left top panel is a G2SI that's uh, connected to uh, a HDX robot, which allows for uh, fast, uh, high throughput um, exchange experiments to be carried out. And there's also an HDX manager, which is shown uh, in the bottom right panel, which uh, allows for uh, resolving of the peptides uh, and uh, generation of peptides through a, a pepsin column. And both of these are maintained at uh, low temperatures, under 4 degrees, in order to minimize uh, back exchange of deuterons that have exchanged onto the protein back into the mobile phase. And on the top right panel is our um, original uh, Generation 1 Synapt instrument. So the most important uh, application of deuterium exchange is is in a, a comparative analysis. If you want to look at uh, protein or ligand interactions, uh, or in, in our case, so we're looking at fragment interactions, you'd have to do a comparative experiment um, of uh, uh, under two conditions of the protein, the protein free in solution or the apoprotein, and you measure the deuterium exchange across all of the pepsin fragment peptides 
uh, at given time points and compare the same with the protein in, the co in complex with ligand or fragments. And so those regions that do show differences are then used to, uh, are then mapped onto the crystal structure in order to then identify what the binding sites. But in addition, you also get uh, insights into the possible allosteric sites and other induced conformational changes upon ligand binding. So it not only tells you whether a ligand binds, it tells you where it binds, but it also tells you what its effects are on the rest of the protein as well. So um, the... Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very ideal uh, method for looking at different kinds of perturbations. So that's what's summarized here. So if you, if you have a target protein, it can be perturbed by ligands, DNA, lipids, physical perturbance like temperature, pH, salts, or you can look at the effects of post-translational modifications or protein-protein interactions. So it can be used to study the effects of any kind of perturbations, and, and that's what makes it a very powerful and versatile method. And some of the, uh, our recent work, we've looked at all of these uh, types of uh, perturbations. So for protein-protein interactions, um, the, the second part of the webinar will also cover more of how it can be used for uh, mapping protein-protein uh, interactions. And you can also look at uh, membrane-protein uh, dynamics using um, uh, surrogates for membrane proteins. Uh, one of the most common ones being used now are nanodisks, and uh, this allows for uh, capturing uh, dynamics of uh, membrane proteins in a membrane-like environment. So uh, one application we looked at was to map the effects of phosphorylation on a signaling protein called Reg-A. Uh, so on the left top uh, corner uh, is a heat map of the protein in its unphosphorylated state. And so there's relatively more exchange across the entire uh, protein, and that's uh, reflected in the red and yellow uh, heat map colors that are seen for the protein for the same time of ex deuterium exchange. And when you compare it with what happens upon phosphorylation, you don't see so much exchange. So this indicated that phosphorylation resulted in a large-scale ordering of the entire molecule. And interestingly, uh, in an activating mutant uh, shown below, this mutant uh, shows high activity just as much as the phosphorylated protein. So uh, in, 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 in if you, you might have expected that the heat map would be similar to the phosphorylated protein, but interestingly, the heat map looks just like the unphosphorylated protein. So it's, it, it was indicative of different allosteric relay networks that are triggered by phosphorylation, and these are distinct from what can be seen with activating mutants. So uh, one uh, visual interface that uh, Waters has developed is known as Dynamex, and this allows for uh, protein-wide deuterium exchange profiling. In the top uh, left-hand corner is what's known as a mirror plot or a butterfly plot. And in this uh, plot, on the y-axis is represented the relative exchange, uh, uh, and on the, the x-axis, each of the points represents one uh, pepsin fragment peptide listed from the N to the C terminus. And each of the plots represents one uh, deuterium exchange uh, time point. So shown here uh, are uh, the uh, deuterium exchange time points from half a minute to 10 minutes deuterium exchange. And so it's a middle plot because uh, on the positive end of the y-axis, you have uh, the protein without any perturbation. And on the negative end of the y-axis, you have the effects of the perturbation. And you can track uh, uh, protein-wide what the effects of the perturbation are. 
And if you want to localize um, those regions, uh, the bottom uh, left uh, panel shows you a difference plot. And the difference plot is a subtraction to identify what the effects of the perturbation are. So for this example, most of the peptides show no changes in the presence of the perturbation, but except for those in boxes red and green. So the red box represents a region where there's a decreased exchange in the presence of the perturbation, while the green is an increase uh, exchange in the presence of the perturbation. So it allows you a snapshot view of uh, across the entire protein of what's changing and what's not uh, uh, due to the presence of the perturbation. So this is a very valuable visual interface for looking at any kinds of perturbations and their effects on proteins. So one of the most uh, more recent patients we have been looking at is not just individual proteins. So in our example two, we've we've looked at uh, whole viruses. So large macromolecular assemblies uh, like viruses can also be analyzed by uh, HDXMS. So in this example, we took a virus and. Um, perturbed it with one kind of perturbation, and so do a perturbation analysis, carry out deuterium exchange, um, uh, allow it to um, undergo the effects of the perturbation, and then measure the effects of deuterium exchange, followed by the quench conditions uh, using our Synapt uh, G2SI for its increased sensitivity, we were able to uh, capture change in the whole virus. So you can, co you can do a perturbation analysis, as is shown here on the left side, is one one condition of the virus, you can capture the uh, the, the relative exchange across the different uh, peptides, and you can also uh, capture the changes uh, in, in, in uh, upon a perturbation. So it's not restricted to individual proteins, but can also be used to study uh, whole proteomes in macromolecular assemblies like viruses. So this is a very important application of HDXMS. Um, for uh, mapping the dynamics of large uh, macromolecular assemblies. So the focus of this webinar is to look for, uh, uh, is to study the, uh, if, uh, the applications of deuterium exchange for uh, small molecule uh, drug discovery. And so the first part I'm going to focus on um, what we have used as test proteins for studying uh, the effects of ligands and proteins. So we've looked at two test proteins. One of them is the regulatory subunit of, a, of an important kinase called protein kinase A or PKA and how it interacts with its um, ligand, cyclic adenosine monophosphate or CMP and its analogs. And we've also then followed it up with another test protein that's routinely used uh, as a model for uh, fragment-based drug discovery. This is the ATPase domain of heat shock protein HSP90, where we have compared the interactions with natural inhibitors uh, and fragments. So to introduce uh, what the uh, regulatory subunit of protein kinase A is, it is the primary receptor for cyclic AMP uh, in eukaryotes. So it consists of a catalytic subunit that's, uh, uh, that's um, bound to its regulatory subunit. So the regulatory subunit is the one that wraps around in this crystal structure uh, around the kinase and keeps it in an inactive state. So when cyclic AMP, there's two binding sites when it binds to the regulatory subunit, that leads to dissociation of the, of the active kinase. It unleashes the activity of the kinase. And there's two uh, cyclic AMP binding sites that are denoted by um, the yellow arrows, which um, uh, allow for cyclic AMP to bind to this pocket, and that induces a change uh, in, in the regulatory cell. So the uh, regulatory subunit uh, undergoes large conformational changes, and this was um, shown by crystallography, where in the absence of cyclic AMP, it, it has a, uh, as an extended free conformation known as the H conformation, and it, it becomes a much more compact molecule uh, when it's bound to cyclic AMP. So wanted to, the most um, 
uh, we wanted to look at what the binding sites are and what are the effects of cyclic AMP on the protein. And this is the same example uh, I showed you earlier for perturbation analysis. So the most obvious question is where is the binding site uh, on the regulatory subunits if you ca if you carry out the uh, deuterium exchange and if you see the mirror plot and the difference plot, it showed us that the red regions, the set of contiguous peptides, showed reduced exchange uh, in the presence of cyclic AMP, but also showed a region in green which showed increased exchange. So uh, we not only capture the binding site, which is consistent with crystallography, but you can also get insights into allosteric uh, sites and allosteric induced conformational changes upon ligand binding. So this is the most obvious application of uh, HMS. But then we went a step further. We wanted to look at can we distinguish between uh, cyclic AMP agonists and antagonists. Uh, antagonists. And uh, um, what was known early on is that cyclic AMP, if you if you substitute the exocyclic oxygens uh, of the uh, cyclic AMP phosphodiester bond. Um, with sulfurs, then you generate either an antagonist or an agonist. So the R enantiomeric form uh, is an antagonist, while the S enantiomer is an agonist. And the antagonist binds to the kinase, but it prevents, uh, it blocks its dissociation. So we wanted to study whether we can use HDXMS to compare agonist and antagonist bound states of the protein. So uh, when we first uh, looked at the effects of antagonist binding, it bound to the whole complex of regulatory and catalytic subunit and caused changes in conformation because you're seeing changes in deuterium exchange without dissociation. And we could localize where those changes are within the regulatory subunit. So there are regions in blue which show decreased exchange uh, upon binding uh, the antagonist, but it still was not allowing for dissociation. So what this uh, showed evidence for was induced fit, which is the antagonist binds to the pocket, but it disrupts the natural allosteric communication that's radiating out of this binding pocket. So uh, that was the first. We then uh, coupled our uh, HDX studies with uh, crystallography. So uh, the structure of the apoprotein without any ligand bound uh, was uh, we solved that and compared the structures of uh, uh, the cyclic AMP and agonist bound, which uh, showed the same conformation, conformational state one. But interestingly, the antagonist, when it bound, it, it results it resulted in, an, in a helical rearrangement, so which resembles the inactive conformation of the regulatory subunit. So in order to distinguish whether there's uh, any effect of antagonist in switching of conformation, we carried out ion mobility mastery with the same uh, Synapt uh, G2SI instrument. And what we found, and this ion mobility mass spec allows you to distinguish uh, shapes of um, molecules on the basis of their collisional cross-sectional areas. And when, it's, when you compare the agonist-bound uh, regulatory subunit in green with, uh, with the green ligand, with the antagonist-bound, they showed differences in collisional cross-sectional area, even though they had the same, uh, uh, same masses. What was interesting was that the apoprotein straddled a distribution that, inclu that covered, uh, straddled both the agonist-bound and antagonist-bound states. So it was providing evidence for conformational uh, selection. And if the isotopic envelopes of the binding site itself, HDXMS gives you clear uh, uh, signatures for distinguishing agonist and antagonist bound states. So the, when you look at the APOR distribution on the left panel, the exchange is high, and but uh, when the antag when the agonist is bound, it sh it shows a, a great reduction in deuterium exchange. The antagonist also binds this pocket, but it, it it does not cause the same effect as that of an agonist. So you can distinguish clearly between agonist and antagonist pairs. It's very sensitive for measuring these differences. So. Um, we we had shown that you can look at uh, micromolar to nanomolar binding uh, uh, ligands, and then you're sensitive to that with HDXMS when you use cyclic AMP or its analogs. But can this 
be applied to fragments, which are uh, low affinity ligands. These are derivatives of drug molecules that are smaller than 250 Daltons, and they bind typically with low affinity in the high micromolar to low millimolar uh, ranges to the target proteins. So this is important because fragment-based drug design uh, is, is, is a process for allowing you to link or expand fragments, multiple fragments, to generate high affinity binders. If you can identify lead fragment um, molecules, this can be applied for uh, FBDD. So we chose HSP90, the ATPase domain. It has natural ligands, ATP and ADP. The natural inhibitors, radicicol and gelatinomycin, are well known. And then there's two classes of fragments, the aminopyrimidines and phenolic compounds, and this is all publicly available. So uh, binding affinities of the natural inhibitors are in the nanomolar range. So gelatinomycin derivative and radicicol at nanomolar, and the two phenolic class compounds are at half a millimolar, so very uh, low binding affinity, and these are smaller than 250 Daltons. So we wanted to compare the uh, HDXMS profiles of the natural inhibitor bound uh, HSP90 with uh, that bound to fragments. And so first we looked at what are all the fast exchanging amide protons because then these would be the effective probes for the ligand interactions. And what these particular peptides are are mapped onto the structure of HSP90. They are the blue regions shown here, which represent all of the regions um, that exchange uh, uh, rapidly uh, and represent the fast exchanging amide protons. So in the top panel, the relative exchange, they show between uh, 0.35 to 0.7 uh, or 35 to 70 percent exchange within the time course that we have uh, examined. So these represent our, our probes for measuring interactions with uh, ligands. So um, when we compare the effects of radicicol and AAG, the regions that show differences in the difference plot are, are, uh, are highlighted in uh, dashed red boxes. And these show decreased exchange across the different time points. And so that allows you to map what the effects of natural inhibitor binding are. When we come in with fragments, fragments show smaller magnitude shifts, but also show the same uh, overlapping uh, regions as seen in the natural inhibitors. But in addition, there's also uh, a region, the helical region in red, which shows uh, decreased exchange upon binding the fragments. So how do we distinguish between where the binding is, what is the orthosteric binding site from induced conformational changes is highlighted through a careful kinetic analysis that can be done. Uh, and so for, can, for, for clarity, only, only two time points are shown here, the 10-minute deuterium exchange in blue and the half-a-minute uh, exchange uh, uh, profile in orange. And so if you look at the uh, peptides within the green dashed box, there is decreased exchange with radicicol, AAG, and fragments that are visible at half a minute, and the magnitude drops uh, uh, with increased time. But what's interesting is every other peptide shows decreased exchange uh, at the 10-minute time point. There's this inversion of where you see the protection uh, between early and late time points. And so we think because the binding has to occur first, the region within the green box represents the orthosteric binding site, and the fragment mimics the binding site, shows the same binding site as the natural inhibitors. But those regions in blue represent allosteric changes, induced conformational changes, which occur at a, a later time point. So careful kinetic analysis can allow a distinction between uh, orthosteric effects and uh, other long-range conformational changes. Uh, HDXMS is, is highly sensitive to not only probing uh, high affinity ligands, but also low affinity fragments. So if you look at one particular peptide in red uh, of HSP90 uh, residues 126 to 141, the uh, Two, although the two fragments, EA4 and EA1, bind with very low affinity, which is comparable in the low millimolar range, uh, only EA4 shows a protection that's similar to radicicol 
uh, but the EA1 does not. So it's not nonspecific. The changes we see are highly specific and allows uh, uh, an identification of uh, unique fragment interactions uh, with the target proteins. So by uh, combining orthogonal uh, uh, fragment profiles, uh, this can offer uh, important insights into lead fragment discovery and also for um, base drug design, and that's uh, summarized in the slide here. So HDXMS is perfectly poised uh, to be a method uh, that's immediately downstream of high-throughput binding assays. It not only allows for screening, it also maps where the interactions are, allows you to identify lead uh, fragments, and also through the iterative process of FBDD offers an important validation uh, methodology, and so it's, it's a powerful uh, addition to FRAGOC design. So to summarize, uh, HDXMS is really powerful to look at dynamics of proteins and solution. You can also use it to look at any kinds of perturbations, including physical uh, perturbance like salts and excipients, if you're looking at biological uh, proteins, uh, uh, biological drugs. And uh, it for drug screening with uh, fragment compounds of low affinity, uh, you can you can carry this out, uh, and it's it's relatively um, uh, fast a screening process. And for this, the short labeling times are more relevant, we think, for low affinity fragment screening. And you can uh, identify the differential changes uh, offered by different uh, low affinity fragments, and these uh, offer valuable leads for combinatorial synthetic chemistry. To acknowledge members of my group. Uh, Suguna Badiradi in green was a grad student who graduated who carried out the work on the cyclic AMP uh, analogs and uh, conformational selection. Uh, uh, Swaminathan saw the structure of the uh, regulatory subunit. I'd like to thank members of the HDX R&D group uh, uh, at uh, Waters in Milford, Michael Eggertson and Keith Fajan, as well as Mark Ritchie in, in, in Singapore. Uh, Andreas Larson and Anna Janssen uh, provided us HSP90 and the uh, and the uh, fragment molecules. I'd like to thank Water Center of Innovation Program, the NUS Academic Research Fund, and the Ministry of Education Tier 3 grant. Um, the current groups are Arun and Srinath, who did the work on HSP90. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ganesh. That was a great presentation to get us started. You gave our audience some great insight into the advanced applications of HDXMS for drug discovery. So we thank you for that. Before we move on to Kai's presentation, I want to remind everyone once again to submit questions for a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit Submit. All of our speakers will be available to answer your questions after the final presentation. So. Let's get our last presentation underway. Kai, the audience is listening. Thank you, Jeff. Today I will share some experience in applications of hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry in drug discovery. The protein backbone amide hydrogens are exchangeable with deuterium from the solvent. Aside from experimental variables such as pH and temperature, the main contributors for exchange are intramolecular hydrogen bonding and solvent accessibility. The amide hydrogens at the surface exchange fast, while the ones that are buried or in stable hydrogen bonds exchange much slower. Therefore, the amount and rate of deuterium uptake can be measured to probe protein structures and dynamics. For active mapping applications, the protein with and without binding partner are analyzed in parallel and the differences in hydrogen deuterium exchange profiles are analyzed. We also do off-exchange approach, where the protein are incubated in D2O prior to complex formation and exchanged with water over a time course. Sometimes structural changes observed in on-exchange are not shown in off-exchange experiments. Therefore, the off-exchange sometimes helps distinguish structural changes from actual binding and also add confidence to the findings from on exchange. General active mapping workflow include backbone amide labeling at physiological pH and room temperature, 
quenching by lower the, temp the pH to about 2.5 and temperature to about 0 degrees Celsius. Digestion, peptide separation, mass spectrometry analysis, data processing, and careful interpretation. Waters offer tools to do entire HDXMS workflow in one package. Since our purchase of this fully integrated platform in 2011, it has been heavily used and become part of our drug discovery process. The deuterium labeling and quenching are performed by using a robotic system, allowing overnight setup up to 54 runs. The labeled protein is digested online using the enzymate BEH pepsin column. The HDX manager is set at 0.5 degrees Celsius, while the trapping of the peptic peptides and UPLC separation occur at this low temperature to minimize the back exchange. There is a pepsin column compartment, so the digestion con temperature can be controlled separately. After separation on the BEHC18 column, using nanoacuity UPLC, the peptic peptides are analyzed in electrospray mass spectrometer. We have, two, we have used two mass spectrometers from Waters, CNAPG2 and Zivo G2 XS, both providing high resolution data. Data analysis is much faster because of the software development, which cuts the labor time from weeks to days, sometimes as quick as a couple of days. For peptide identification, the MS to the E data of the undeuterated control is processed by using ProteinLynx Global Server, PLGS, which is a score-based probability system. The list of peptides are then imported to Dynamics, where average mass shifts of deuterated samples are calculated from centroid, uptake profiles are constructed, and the exchanges of the free and bonded proteins are compared. Dynamics offers multiple visual tools to choose from for results delivery. Because of the innovations in both hardware and software on automatic platform, the HDXMS became much easier and faster, and the high throughput became possible. Because temperature and pH are main contributors to hydrogen deuterium exchange, they need to be well controlled. Good sequence coverage is necessary to localize the exchange and minimize the undetermined regions. In many cases, the quench buffer and digestion conditions need to be optimized. Back exchange control is a critical part, which is to retain the deuterium label as much as possible before being analyzed by mass spectrometer. Carryover is monitored to avoid the miscalculation of mass shift and misinterpretation of exchange mechanism. Peptides identified by PLGS should be checked manually, while processing and filtering parameters may need a revisit. Sometimes interference peaks add complexity to peak identification and the ion assignments need to be verified. The HDXMS findings are mapped to crystal structure if available. If not, go for modeling. As a mass spec person, I'm grateful that we have Lily colleagues who are experts in multiple disciplines. The discussions with them really help to relate HDXMS results to biophysical properties, biological activities, and results from orthogonal techniques. Studies performed in our hands include epitope mapping when binding to monoclonal antibodies, sometimes with peritope mapping, epitope mapping when binding to peptides, protein-protein interactions. The change of deuterium uptake profile could be directly on the binding sites or the non-range allosteric conformational changes as a result of binding. Also, the binding of two proteins may engage the binding to a third party. For conformational studies, we have evaluated the effects of mutations on protein structures and compared bispecifics versus MATS. First case study, active mapping of antigen-antibody complexes. We have two monoclonal antibodies, MAP1 and MAP2. 
that showed biological differences. Beer core study showed when MAP1 binds to an antigen, MAP2 is blocked from binding. However, if MAP2 binds first, MAP1 still binds. What's going on? The project team asked to compare the epitopes when binding to these two MAPs. The antigen with and without each MAP were analyzed under the same experimental conditions over a time course of hydrogen deuterium exchange, and the mass shifts were compared through on exchange and off exchange. The peptic peptides of the undeuterated control are identified by using the MS to the E data in PLGS where the max accuracy and fragmental ions are used for scoring. A list of peptides are exported to Dynamics, and the peptides that are selected to be monitored are shown as blue bars in the sequence coverage map. The detected mass changes are at peptide level. The overlapping peptides help narrowing down the exchange to a smaller region. Also, they add confidence to the findings in the same region. The chromatogram from UPLC fast separation at low temperature is shown on the bottom, while peptides were eluted within eight minutes with decent separations. The data files at each labeling interval were processed in Dynamics software. Here are examples of mass spectra. From bottom to top, the labeling time increases from time zero to one hour. From left to right, they are free antigen, antigen with MAP1, and antigen with MAP2. The ions for each peptide were searched with predetermined criteria. The blue lines are processed isotopes, which were selected as part of the isotope envelope to calculate the centroid, the average mass shift. The dashed lines indicate the centroid, and average mass shift from control is highlighted in gray. Overall, Dynamics does a good job of picking the right isotopes from the interference peaks, as shown in the center plots. The mass shifts in the first and the third column are similar. However, the middle column show less deuterium uptake at both labeling time points, suggesting a possible binding region with MAP1 only. This region will be referred as epitope B in the following slides. The relative uptake of deuterium was plotted as a function of exposure in logarithmic view. The red line is antigen alone, blue line is antigen with MAP1 complex, and green line is antigen with MAP2 complex. For the peptide in the first plot, both complexes showed slower deuterium uptake over the time course, suggesting a probable binding region epitope A. In addition, the green line which is MAP2 complex, showed more solvent protection than the blue line, which may imply a stronger binding of MAP2 in this region. In the second plot, the blue line, which is MAP1 complex, showed slower deuterium uptake, suggesting a unique epitope when binding to MAP1. In the third plot, unique conformational change in MAP1 complex was observed. When binding to MAP1, more exchange occurred in this region, suggesting that it became less protected and more dynamic. The findings in off-exchange approach on the bottom are consistent with the findings from on-exchange. In off-exchange, because the time zero has to be undeuterated control, the starting deuterated sample is now given a pseudo exposure time of 0 0.001 minute, so that dynamics can treat it as a time point to process. The deuterium amount at each time point is still calculated as mass shift from the undeuterated control, but now the exchange profile shows deuterium loss over exposure time to H2O. Here, uptake chart is to compare protein states over the time course for epitope B region. Each color is a time point, and each bar group is a protein state. The left chart is for on exchange, and the right chart is for off exchange. In the left chart, the middle bar group, which is MAP1 complex, showed slower deuterium uptake than the other two. In the right chart, the deuterium loss in the middle bar group is slower than the other two. 
Both indicate this region became protected from exchange when binding to MAP1. Here are two butterfly plots for binding to MAP1. The first plot is the mirror image for unexchange approach, where free antigen is on the top and complex with MAP1 is on the bottom. The x-axis is the sequence from N-terminus to C-terminus, and the y-axis is the relative fractional uptake. Each point represents a peptide at one time point, and each line represents a time point of all peptides. In this case, the labeling time went from 10 seconds to 2 hours. The regions in blue boxes, epitope A and epitope B, showed less hydrogen deuterium exchange in the complex over the time course, suggesting discontinuous epitope. Between these two epitope regions, more deuterium uptake was observed, suggesting conformational changes. The second plot is off-exchange, where the deuterated samples were exposed to water over a time course. This is another view of butterfly plot where difference index is used to compare the two states, free antigen on the top and complex on the bottom in each plot. Each vertical bar represents the sum of differences over all exposure time points for each peptide. The discontinuous epitope and the conformational changes are obvious. Here is the butterfly plot for binding to MAP2. The exchange difference in epitope A is very clear at all exposure time points. The exchange data are tied for all other peptides. In each plot, free antigen is on the top and a complex is on the bottom. The difference index plot clearly shows less deuterium uptake in epitope A region when binding to MAP2 suggesting linear epitope. The data is very clean in that a very little difference was observed between free antigen and complex other than epitope A region. Heat map is to display the deuterium uptake by coloring each residue. In the comparison view, if the free antigen and complex have the same deuterium uptake, the residue is colored green. If less deuterium uptake in the complex, it's changing towards red. If more deuterium uptake in the complex, it's changing towards blue. Here, the top map is a comparison between antigen and MAP1 complex, and the bottom map is a comparison between an antigen and MAP2 complex. The orange or red regions suggest the probable epitope regions, and the blue region on the top map indicates conformational changes when binding to MAP1. HDMS data suggested discontinuous epitope when binding to MAP1 and linear epitope when binding to MAP2. Now with this data, one could explain that when MAP2 is bound to its linear epitope A, the discontinuous epitope still allows MAP1 to bind to epitope B. When MAP1 is bound to both epitope A and B, MAP2 is blocked from binding. Conformational changes were observed while binding to MAP1. Second case study is on protein antibody binding. A monoclonal antibody is known to bind to a receptor and the project team need to know the binding sites of both parties. Epitope mapping was performed with excessive of antibody than the stoichiometry model ratio, and both on-exchange and off-exchange were performed. Paratope mapping was performed with excessive of receptor than the stoichiometry model ratio. The top figure is butterfly plot where well, exchange differences in two regions are labeled as primary and secondary epitope in blue boxes. The uptake profiles are plotted using linear exposure axis for both on-exchange and off-exchange. Clear differences between the free receptor in red and complex in blue are observed. Both peptides are protected from exchange over the time course, most likely due to the direct binding. 
The first figure is the crystal structure of the receptor. The two active regions are mapped to the crystal structure and colored in red and brown. These two regions, which are well separated in the primary sequence, are right next to each other in spatial structure. The figure on the right is when three interaction parties are in place. Well, the red and brown regions are located in the ligand binding site. Beer core competition assay confirmed this finding that the map blocks ligand binding. Paratope mapping was performed by comparing map alone to its complex with the receptor. The top figure is butterfly plot for light chain and the bottom figure is for heavy chain. Because IgG1 map is resistant to pepsin digestion, harsh conditions such as denaturing agent and the longer digestion time need to be used to improve sequence coverage at the cost of more back exchange. In this case, the sequence coverages for light chain and heavy chain are 88% and 82% respectively. The main deuterium uptake difference was observed in CDRH2. As shown in the circular region, this 13 residue peptide became significantly protected from exchange in the complex. For example, at two hour labeling, the deuterium incorporation in the complex is two Daltons less. Other peptides at CDRH1 L3 and L2 also showed protection from exchange upon binding. These regions most likely contain the sites of interactions with the receptor and are therefore considered possible paratope. In addition, a small difference at CDRH3 was observed, which is inconclusive. Two epitope regions determining this study are consistent with the crystal structure and beer core competition assay. The results for paratope mapping of the map are similar to the results from anonym scanning. Third case study, epitope mapping when binding to peptides. The purpose is to do epitope mapping of a receptor while binding to four internally discovered peptides. Binding assay results show that binding to any of these peptides does not block the binding of the receptor to the ligand. HDXMS experiments were set up for epitope mapping and comparison of the four peptides. This is a vertical view of the butterfly plot of the receptor, which some people find easier to view and capture the difference. Each plot is a mirror image to compare the free receptor to complex. All the complexes showed the same protection region in a blue box, suggesting the same epitope region. Four heat maps are shown here. The comparison view of each heat map clearly shows the major difference between free receptor and the complex with each peptide. The circled red region shows less deuterium uptake in each complex, indicating probable epitope region. The darkness of red on the top map implies the strongest binding of peptide 1 to the receptor. Heat map in dynamics could be exported to PIMO scripts. The example on this slide is for receptor with and without peptide 1 at deuterium exposure of 10 seconds. The figures on the left show the heat map of each individual state on crystal structure. The figure on the right shows the comparison between the free receptor and the complex with peptide 1. The main difference is the epitope region where the solid line arrow points to. This is different from the ligand binding site where the dashed line arrow points to. Same epitope region was found for binding with all the four peptides and the binding site is different from the ligand binding site which is consistent with the binding assay results, non-competitive. The complex with peptide 1 showed the most solvent protection in the epitope, suggesting peptide 1 has the strongest binding with the receptor. Later, peptide 1 was found to have the best affinity. HDXMS has been recognized as a powerful tool to study protein structures, interactions, and dynamics. 
because of the high sensitivity of mass spec, only a small amount of material is needed. It provides information about protein dynamics in solution, which could be mapped to static crystal structure to generate better understanding of interactions. It allows to analyze proteins that cannot be crystallized due to unstructured regions or cannot be analyzed by NMR due to the large size. Localization of the change is at a peptide level, so HDXMS resolution is driven by how well the protein digests, how many overlapping peptides are identified, and peptide lengths. Single residue resolution is not achieved yet, but possible via electron transfer dissociation fragmentation. Comparison to results from other orthogonal techniques is recommended as a routine practice to help verify the HDXMS findings. Critical residues could be verified by site-directed mutagenesis, where one needs to be careful not to perturb the protein structure. I'd like to thank Lily colleagues who have been really helpful. My boss, John Fitchett, MassSpec group leader, and Brian Jones, group leader of Protein Biosciences Group, and colleagues in protein engineering, molecular biology, structural biology, bioinformatics, and the leadership. I'd also like to thank engineers and specialists from Waters for their consistent support. Thank you for your attention. That was excellent. Thanks very much, Kai. I think our audience now has a great sense of the power of HDX-MS for characterizing protein therapeutics during drug discovery and development. So before we start our Q&A session, I want to let everyone know this is your final chance to submit your questions for our speakers. We've gotten some really great questions already, but I'm encouraging you, all of you to keep them coming. All right, while everyone is submitting their final round of questions, let's begin the Q&A so that we can try and get to as many questions as possible. First question is for Ganesh. Uh, Ganesh, can you use single point HDXMS at the protein peptide level instead of high throughput binding assay during fragment-based drug design study? Uh, yes, you can. It, it's quite flexible. If you if you have a library of compounds that you do want to screen, and if you want to know if a particular compound is 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 binding the target protein or not, you could do a single early time as early as possible, like half a minute or one minute uh, screening, uh, to identify those compounds that are indeed binding to your target protein. And so once you've identified those that do bind, you can then do a more detailed uh, kinetic analysis. All righty. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, our next question is for Kai. Kai, one of our audience members would like to know, why do epitope mapping? What value does HDXMS bring in epitope mapping? Okay, sure. Um, locating and characterizing the site of interaction on antigen is really necessary for understanding the biological activities and the mechanism in drug discovery. Um, also, it's for um, purpose uh, to protect the intellectual property and it's for a regulatory purpose. Um, the HDX-MS is um, really a fast and effective approach compared to most of other methods to localizing the, for localizing the epitope region. Um, the experiment is done in the native state, which is necessary for the determination of discontinuous or conformational epitope. It's uh, performed in solution, which is very complementary to the static picture from X-ray crystallography. And also, it only needs a small amount of material, and it has tolerance for interference in the mixture. Um, so basically, and also, uh, it allows to obtain the structural information, dynamics information for proteins that cannot be crystallized or done by NMR. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Uh, so we have another question for Ganesh. Uh, Ganesh, the audience member wants to know, why don't you see uh, exchange at side chain positions? Why is exchange at the backbone amide hydrogen position slower compared to, say, side chains, asparagines, or glutamine? Yeah, that's a great question. It has to do with uh, the resonance in the peptide backbone. So there's resonance and rigidity and planarity of the peptide backbone that makes the exchange to the back, at the backbone amide position much slower than those of the side chains. 
So side chains exchange really quickly, uh, but they also off exchange. So while analysis, there's loss of the side chain exchange into the mobile phase during analysis. And so you never see what's happening at the side chain. But since backbone amide hydrogen exchange is much slower, you can monitor it um, uh, in the course of the experiment. So the on exchange is slower, the off exchange is also slower, so you can uh, capture it. Thank you. Thanks, Ganesh. Uh, Kai, we have another question for you. Uh, one of our audience members asked, what are the challenges of doing epitope mapping by HDX-MS? Um, yes, um, there, are, there are a few challenges. Um, first of all is that um, sometimes you got poor sequence coverage is because of the um, digestion um, difficulty. So that that requires optimization of parameters, especially digestion conditions. But some most of the time it costs the um, back exchange, increasing back exchange. Also, um, proteins need good affinity and a slow off rate to do that HDXMS for epitope mapping. And uh, also, uh, in the data interpretation, allosteric conformational changes and protein overall global protein stabilization and uh, side chain interactions also add complexity to the data interpretation. So uh, we have to be careful about that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, Ganesh, question for you. Can you monitor binding of hydrobo hydrophobic fragments that are not water soluble? Um, yeah, that's that's an important uh, point. Um, you have to the the compounds that you use because you're looking at uh, a, a dynamics in solution. Uh, the ligands have to be uh, water soluble. Uh, some proteins, if they do tolerate uh, up to 10% DMSO, they could you could um, dissolve the the more hydrophobic compounds in DMSO and then um, use that to introduce it to the protein. But uh, there has to be um, quite a high um, a high water solubility of the compounds that we're testing. Thanks. All righty, thank you, Ganesh. Our next question is uh, for Kai. Kai, uh, one of our audience members wants to know, how do you differentiate allosteric impact versus ligand binding site if both are identified by a reduction in HD exchange? Um, sure, I totally agree. We have to be careful about allosteric movements at long distances from the binding site, especially with small molecules. Um, Off-exchange approach may help because sometimes it doesn't show structural changes um, that was shown on, in, on, in on exchange. And also, um, there are sometimes the profile in off exchange can be different. Uh, an example is that one region showed solvent protection all across the time points in on exchange, but in off exchange, the, the deuterium loss went, went down to almost zero um, in the off exchange. And then the real binding side can actually hold from um, deuterium loss. But and then later we found in paper that the, um, the region that showed the different profile in off exchange, that one is actually has, um, uh, has uh, two conformers in the region. So that, 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 that's a good example of showing that off exchange can actually distinguish from the, um, to help distinguish the uh, structure changes. And uh, also, um, another important thing is to relate the HDXMS results to biological activities for consistency and also to compare to the results from orthogonal techniques. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kai. Uh, Ganesh, we have another question for you. Um, one of our audience members would like to know, how do you assess the differences between states? For example, what is the threshold do you use for assaying significant differences? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. It's an important question. So there was a, a really um, a, a comprehensive study done by um, Damien Hood um, and John Engen's group. So they had this paper from 2011 where they um, uh, compared, they did, they did multiple replicate analysis, looked at numerous states, and then they uh, uh, calculated the, uh, the, 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 the threshold for significant difference to be uh, 0 0.5 plus or minus 0 0.5 deuterons. So anything that's a magnitude 
uh, difference in deuterium exchange that's greater than 0.5 based on the study is, is, is what we use as, as, as our significance threshold to, to identify regions that are um, showing significant differences between one state and another. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ganesh. So it looks like our last question is going to be for Kai. Um, Kai, uh, one of our audience members wants to know, what software do you use to obtain butterfly plot? Um, I'm using Dynamics 3.0 from Waters. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kai. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived for six months on our website. So if you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or feel free to forward the link to your friends and colleagues, which we always recommend. Uh, I'd like to thank Ganesh and Kai again for their informative presentations, and I'd like to thank the audience members for their attention and thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Waters for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen webinar in the near future. And goodbye for now.